Okay, thank you for that introduction, and wow, what a night. Are these tips for me? <laughs> Somebody forgot all the cash here. Wow, that was really fascinating to see all this enthusiasm and all this help for PCRF. I've, you know, I speak a lot in a lot of different places, but I have to say PCRF is one organization, and Steve is one guy that I have the utmost, for whom I have the utmost respect. Um, it's not just the ability to gather people and to raise the money, but it's to get the work done, you know, to get stuff done. And that takes a remarkable guy like Steve and remarkable volunteers all across the country and, of course, all of you to come here and support it. So let's, uh, let's, let's give it up one more time for PCRF and for Steve and everybody. Yeah. So there's supposed to be a slideshow up there somewhere, but... I'll just get started anyway. So like you heard before uh, in the introduction, I almost always preface my remarks but with a disclaimer, although I don't think I'll need to do it tonight, but, and that is that, oh, there we go. Um, if anybody expect a, or expected a balanced presentation from me, then they will be sorely disappointed. Uh, my presentation, my talk on Palestine, my take on the issue is clearly and decidedly one-sided. Um, I don't believe there is balance in this issue. I don't believe anybody has a balanced view or a balanced presentation on this issue because if you're up here talking, you probably have a strong point of view. And it's not a balanced issue. One of the, I think one of the myths that's out there, one of the misunderstandings about the issue of Palestine is that there's an Israel and there's a Palestine and they're at war and they just don't get along, and therefore we need peace talks. And therefore for decades now there have been peace talks, and of course the peace talks are failing, so everybody's disappointed. And this is kind of a vicious circle that goes on, and it all emanates, I think, from this very basic misunderstanding that the issue here is an issue of two countries that are at war. The reality is, of course, they're not two countries at war, it's one country, it's called Palestine, it's also called Israel, there are two people living there, but there's one army and one state. And that state and that army are engaged in a vicious, brutal regime of oppression. And what is needed is really not peace talks, but a concerted effort to end the oppression and bring about freedom and, and equality and, and democracy. Another, another uh, misunderstanding on the issue of Palestine is that if you criticize Israel, or if you speak for Palestine, then you're somehow anti-Semitic. Well, I was at an event last week. Some of you may have heard of uh, Sabil. It's a Christian Palestinian organization led by another remarkable man, uh, the Reverend uh, Naim Atik. They were probably, I don't know, the room was about as full as this one. And, um, and it was fascinating to see because half of the speakers who were there to speak on behalf of Palestine were Jewish. So are they all anti-Semitic? And then the whole claim of, of anti-Semitism is quite ridiculous because it means it, it denotes racism. So if you criticize the state of Israel or reject the state of Israel, you're somehow a racist? So what about all the Jewish people that have always rejected, rejected Israel and rejected Zionism? Are they all anti-Semitic? So anyway, the claim of anti-Semitism is nonsense. It's something that is thrown by the other side, by the pro-Israeli groups, when they have no arguments. And they have no arguments because they have no ability to legitimize and to justify what the state of Israel does. Another interesting claim, another myth that, that, that um, overshadows this issue is the Holocaust. Quite often we hear people say that there has to be a state of Israel, there has to be a Jewish state because of the Holocaust. Um, and that Israel is, the, is a response to the Holocaust, and it's also a guarantee that there won't be another Holocaust. And it's an interesting claim that I think is worth examining. Or actually, it's an interesting myth that is worth examining. Because the vast majority, over 90% of Holocaust survivors, did not go to Israel. After World War II, there were about 2 million Jewish refugees in camps in Europe. Over 90% stayed in Europe. Less than 10% immigrated to Israel. And many of the ones who did immigrate left later on because the response to racism, whether it's anti-Semitism or any kind of racism, is not another oppressive regime in another country. 
which is exactly what Israel is. So Jewish people themselves have already said, we do not want and we do not need an Israel. And they said it right after the Holocaust. The very Jewish people who suffered from the Holocaust rejected the idea of Israel. So I think these are myths that are out there that are very important to, to brush away so that we can actually talk about the issues and we can actually focus on the issues. Can I get the first slide, please? So once again, Israel-Palestine is a one country or two. And again, this is one of those misunderstandings. Israel and Palestine is one country. The entire country is Palestine. And of course, it's been called Israel over the last 67 years. But it's one country with one oppressive regime, with one oppressive brutal army, where one side is oppressing the other, and the solution is not going to come through peace talks. The solution is going to come through the support of people like yourselves, and people at Sabil, and people who support BDS, and all these other thousands and thousands of people around the world who reject the idea of this oppressive regime, which is what Israel is today. And that is how we move forward. Can I see the next one, please? So quite often people discuss, or either like to discuss, or reject the idea of discussing how the conflict began. And I think in this case tonight, it's particularly uh, relevant because why do we even need, we heard about this, why do we need a PCRF? Why are Palestinians in this, in this situation anyway? And I think it's fair to say that it all initiated from this concept that white people in Europe thought that they had the right to take somebody else's country, usually people whose skin color is not white, and to divide it, to give it away, to conquer it, to do what they want with it. So pro-Israelis and, 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 and in Israel itself often refer to the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration, they talk about it as though it came down with Moses when Moses was given the Ten Commandments. The Balfour Declaration, as though it is this holy document. So Lord Balfour, who was the British Foreign Secretary, gave a note to his Jewish friend, Lord Rothschild, promising Palestine as a homeland for the Jews. Who is he to give Palestine to anybody? But there you have it. And in Israel, every single city today has a Balfour Street because of that. Then, some several decades later, we had the United Nations partitioning Palestine. Who is the United Nations to partition Palestine? And this instance, this, this uh, resolution by the United Nations that was uh, passed on the 29th of November, 1947, by the way, another street in Israel and many cities is the 29th of November. Because on that day, the United Nations decided they were going to partition Palestine. So they figured so the Jews want it, the Arabs want it, we'll partition it. Kind of a simple solution. However, in 1947, the Jewish population in Palestine numbered about half a million people. These were my grandparents' generation who immigrated and my parents' generation who were born there. As many of you know, the Palestinian population in Palestine at the time was close to a million and a half, three times as much. And somehow the United Nations decided they were going to partition it by giving the larger portion to the smaller Jewish community. Why? How was this going to work? Who knows? But this is what they decided. And to this day, we hear people say, well, you know, this conflict has been going on for so long because the Palestinians rejected the partition plan. Who would not reject a plan that takes your country, the larger portion of your country, and gives it away, or thinks they have the right, to give it away to a small community of immigrants who literally almost just came off the boat? And what's interesting about this particular point in history is that from this point emanates two narratives that are diametrically opposed. Two histories, if you will, that are diametrically opposed, which is why balance is impossible. The differences between the narratives and the histories is, are not minute, it's not details. These are two absolutely 100% opposed histories. Now the story that I learned as an Israeli growing up under the Israeli education system, I, grew, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, is that after the Arabs, because we don't say Palestinians, after the Arabs rejected the partition plan, they began an assault against the Jewish community in Palestine. Thankfully, the Jewish community in Palestine was strong and advanced and maybe a little bit more uh, intelligent, and they were able to defeat the Arabs. The, the war lasted about a year. They were able to defeat the Arabs, conquer almost the entire country, 
and once again, after 2,000 years, establish a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. Now you tell me if you don't, it doesn't sound like another chapter in the Old Testament. It sounds, it's so heroic that it's almost biblical. Who would want to refute that? And that is why this narrative is so strong here in America too. Because it is almost, it sounds almost biblical. Problem is when we take a look at the details. The two communities, the smaller Jewish community and the larger Palestinian community at the time, were both hoping to be established as states. But there was one thing that the Jewish community in Palestine, the Zionist community, invested in heavily. And that is one thing that made all the difference. And that was a fighting force, an armed militia. By 1947, the Zionist militia, in which my father was an officer, numbered close to 40,000 armed, well-trained, well-motivated men. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. In fact, there's never been a Palestinian army, as I'm sure you know. So if this is true, who are these Palestinians that attacked in 1947, and what exactly did they attack with? So now we are forced, or we're not forced, but we realize, thanks to the work of some Israeli historians like Ilan Pape, Avishlaim, and others, who went back and verified what Palestinians have been saying for decades, it was not the Palestinians who began the assault, it was the Zionist militia who began a massive assault. As soon as the United Nations accepted the partition plan, the Zionist militia began a massive assault that can only be categorized as terrorism and ethnic cleansing. And for 12 months, this armed militia attacked a civilian population through terrorism, for the sole purpose of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Later on, six, seven months later, other Arab armies tried to intervene. They were defeated quite easily by the Zionist militia. And in 12 months, they managed to conquer almost 80% of the country, destroy hundreds of towns and villages, some of the names we heard tonight, and force into exile somewhere between 800,000 and a million Palestinians. Now, perhaps the story is not so heroic. I like to say it's not a story of heroism, it's a story of terrorism. But the pieces now fit the puzzle. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, quite often we hear it said here in this country, too, not only in Israel, that perhaps a few Palestinians were forced to leave, perhaps a few Palestinian villages were destroyed, but really there was nothing there. Any progress, any advancement that came to Palestine came after the Zionists arrived came after the Jewish immigration. So I'd like to show this picture of the city of Jaffa before 1948, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. The city of Jaffa before 1948 was a major Arab city on the coast of the Mediterranean. It was a city of close to 120,000 people with theaters and, movie th and, and concert halls with a large business life, a political life, trade unions, a writers' guilds, several newspapers were printed in Jaffa. It was a major Arab city on the coast of the Mediterranean. And in a matter of two weeks in 1948, this city of close to 120,000 was reduced to less than 4,000 people, all concentrated or forced to concentrate in one neighborhood with barbed wires and Israeli guards surrounding them. And if I can have the next slide, please. On the very ashes, on the very place where Yaffa stood, today we have the city of Tel Aviv in a picture that's almost from the exact same angle. Now, Tel Aviv calls itself Tel Aviv Yaffa. And they kept a small portion of the city of Yaffa. And there is still a small Palestinian population in Yaffa, several thousand, neglected, oppressed, subject to racist laws, subject to harassment by Israeli um, law enforcement. Now why this is important is not only because of the history. This is also important because we cannot reduce Palestine to the West Bank and Gaza, which is what Israel has been trying to do and what the whole peace talks uh, industry has been trying to do. Because Palestine is more than the West Bank and Gaza, the problems of Palestinians go way beyond the West Bank and Gaza. They are in Yaffa and they're in the Galilee and they're in Jerusalem and the Nekab Desert and the entire country is Palestine. And this is important to understand in order to understand how we move forward. If I can have the next slide, please. Now, 
I remember the first time I heard the word Nakba. That Palestinians call the war of 1948 the Nakba. As an Israeli, who was still a very uh, patriotic Zionist, I grew up with a very patriotic Zionist upbringing, I was insulted. How could anybody call this heroic, historical event, the creation of the State of Israel, a catastrophe? And if you read my book, or if you've read my book, you know I went through this journey where I acquainted myself with Palestine and with Palestinians, and I learned why it is called the Nakba. But I think what people misunderstand today is when they think that the Nakba happened in 1948. And I think tonight, this is quite relevant. The Nakba didn't happen in 1948. It began in 1948. It continues today. I took this picture at a refugee camp less than a year ago. The Nakba continues today with Palestinian children living in conditions like this, as you can see, without sewage, without running water, without electricity, without access to proper health care, medical care, proper nutrition, clean water. Now, this is not in some you know, remote mountaintop in Afghanistan. This is maybe an hour, half an hour drive from major cities where you wouldn't dream of seeing kids like this. You don't see Israeli children look like this ever, anywhere. The only reason these children live under these conditions is because they are not allowed and their parents are not allowed to return to the places from which their grandparents were forced to leave. This is happening every single day. It is happening under our watch. Thankfully, there's PCRF. Thankfully, generous people like yourselves that are helping these children. But why are they in this position to begin with? And every dollar, taxpayer dollar, that goes to support the state of Israel goes to continue the Palestinian Nakba and make it worse. Because year by year by year, the Palestinian Nakba is getting worse. That children should live under these conditions, under our watch today. We heard before about what it's like to have a parent with a child that, can't, that is sick and we can't get health care. Imagine a child that has an ear infection and we can't ha don't have access to antibiotics. 10 minute drive, 20 minute drive maybe from major medical centers inside Israel. This is unjustifiable and it's inexcusable and it continues day by day, again with the support of three, four billion dollars by the American government to Israel. And that is exactly why this has to stop. Can I have the next one, please? So the way, the way my book goes, it goes it's, it's a memoir, so it goes through my, my, my own personal history. And because my family's involvement with the, state of, with the establishment of the state of Israel, this is all relevant. So there's a story that my mother told me many, many times as I was growing up, and I included it in the book. And this is a picture of my mother when she was young. She was born and raised in Jerusalem. She still lives in Jerusalem. She's 80, almost 88 years old. And when I say Jerusalem, I don't mean the old city. As I'm sure, many, I'm sure you all know, there are the neighborhoods outside of the old city and what later on became the Israeli side of Jerusalem. And um, my mother was 22 years old. She was already a mother at the time in 1948. Uh, she was living in a small apartment with her parents. And when the Zionist forces came and took the Palestinian neighborhoods in West Jerusalem, they got rid of the people, of course, but they kept the houses. In fact, they're still there, beautiful, very distinct Jerusalemite Palestinian homes. And these homes were made available, were offered to Israeli families, and my mother was offered one of these homes. And she refused. And the way she tells the story is with, always with a great deal of passion. She always says, how could I possibly take the home of another family? How could I possibly move into the home of another mother that now has to raise her children in exile? And it's, of course, a wonderful story. We wish more people would have done what she did, but, of course, most people did not. But as a child growing up and hearing this story, I had a serious problem with the story. Something about the story was very troubling to me. And it wasn't until I was actually working on the book that I was able to reconcile and understand the problem. Her story contradicts the national narrative. It contradicts the Zionist history. The Zionist history, the Zionist narrative is morally perfect. And she was presenting a moral dilemma in a story that had no moral dilemmas. Because we, being the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, although that's, that's what the Zionists claim, there's no historical proof, but the Zionists claim that we, the Jews, are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews who lived in that land some two, 3,000 years ago, and therefore it is our land today. So this is our land. We returned, 
and we accepted the partition plan, even though we deserve the whole thing, because we are gracious, we accepted the partition plan. The Arabs rejected it and attacked us. Thankfully, we won. And then, we asked them to stay and they left. We asked the Arab population to stay and they left. So we have a family that left their home and we have a family that needs a home. Where's the moral dilemma? You see, it's a morally perfect story. It's based on myth, but it's a morally perfect story. And even when the Zionist narrative recognizes atrocities, like the massacre of Diryasin, the, 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 which was commemorated just uh, recently. Even when we learn about it, and Israelis do learn about the massacre of Diryasin in school. I remember learning it in school. You know, Diryasin, I'm sure many of you know, was a, small, was a small town on the outskirts of Jerusalem. When the Zionist forces came, Diryasin surrendered, and they were attacked, and a terrible massacre took place. So we learn as kids in Israeli schools that it was a terrible thing, women and children were killed and so forth. However, as a result of the massacre, thousands and thousands of Arabs fled and that allowed us to establish a Jewish majority. And boys and girls, we all know, nothing is more important to us than establishing a Jewish majority in Israel. So once again, it's a morally airtight story. There are no moral dilemmas. And it goes on today. We bomb Gaza and we know we're killing and burning innocent people. But it's okay because Hamas is in Gaza and they're terrorists. So we're okay morally. And I, like I said, once again, my mother was presenting this moral dilemma and, and, and thankfully began this, this crack in the wall of my understanding of the issue. Could you see the next uh, slide, please? So this is... This is what the map looks like between 1948 and 1967. Israel occupied almost all of Palestine, with the exception of the West Bank and Gaza. Once again, we hear Israel was under an existential threat. It began an attack against the Arab armies. This time, 1967, they were able to destroy three Arab armies and defeat them in six days. Talk about a biblical story. They did it in six days. Um, and can I see the next slide, please? And in essence, what Israel did in 1967 is erased Palestine off the map completely and established what Israel had wanted to do from the very beginning, a single state with exclusive rights for Jewish people on all of Palestine. Now, later on, my father was a general at that time, and some of the other generals admitted this was a war of choice, there was no threat, it was a war because they wanted the land, and so forth. But I think it's important today to understand, especially when they talk about these peace talks that have been going on forever. The West Bank wasn't taken by mistake. Cities and towns were not established in the West Bank by mistake. Israel did not conduct ethnic cleansing of the, of the West Bank like it did other parts of Palestine by mistake, nor did they destroy towns and cities and villages in the West Bank by mistake. After Israel took the West Bank, it continued the ethnic cleansing and the colonization of Palestine in the West Bank in order to keep it. In fact, one of the first commands given by the Israeli army after the war of 1967 was that the water in the West Bank belongs to the state of Israel. Of course, as I'm sure you know, one of the largest water sources in Palestine is in the West Bank. The notion that an Israeli government, any Israeli government, any Zionist government, will allow the establishing of a Palestinian state between the Jordan River and the sea is either an absolute misunderstanding or an absolute lie, depending on who's saying it. It is a complete mis misrepresentation of the reality. There is no scenario, there is no way in which an Israeli government will ever allow a compromise on the land because in terms of Zionist thinking, it is all the land of Israel that belongs to the Jewish people. The state of Israel is just a caretaker. Just like Palestinians are not permitted to buy land for the same reason. So there is no way that a Palestinian state will ever emerge between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Israel knows full well that it's governing another nation. 
So it's not really a Jewish state because today the majority of the people who live there are not Jews, they're Palestinians. Most Jewish people don't live there. Most Jewish people live overseas. So it is not a Jewish state in any way, shape, or form. Certainly Zionism does not represent Jewish values. But it is a state that has exclusive rights for Jewish people. And this is the reality that, that, that Israel created immediately with the war of 1967. Can you go on, please? This is a picture of my father still in uniform. And like I said, one of the things that emerged after the war, many generals, like my father said, and I talk about this at length in the book, is that this was a war of choice, there was no existential threat, this was an opportunity, and the state of Israel, the Israeli military, wanted to seize the opportunity and conquer the land. Can we go ahead with the next one, please? One of the issues I think that is sorely missing from the, from the discussion on Palestine is the issue of the Palestinian prisoners. And I think this is again important in the context where Israel is referred to in this country as a democracy. Israel has, and for decades has held, thousands and thousands of Palestinian prisoners. According to Israeli sources, the vast majority of Palestinian prisoners have never been charged with acts of violence. According to Israeli sources, the vast majority of Palestinians in Israeli jails have not been charged with acts of violence, and this is by the Israeli military court. And their standards are very low. In terms of the Israeli military law, a child with a rock is a terrorist. So even though Israel calls them terrorists, they're not terrorists. These are political prisoners. And then, of course, we have hundreds and hundreds of prisoners who have not been charged with anything at all. Samir Sawi is one of them, as you, I'm sure you know, he was a, he, I think he holds the record for hunger strikes in the world, and now his sister Shereen is in, same thing, held without charge. And you have to remember again, these are the this military laws, so even by the low standards of Israeli military law, they found nothing with which to charge them, and they keep them in jail anyway. Now, besides all of that, the world recognizes the rights of people to resist. International law recognizes that people have a right to resist regimes that are racist and colonialist. It's people's rights to resist. Interestingly enough, although the armed portion of the Palestinian resistance gets all the news, as we see represented in the Palestinian prisoner population, the vast majority of Palestinian, prisoner, of Palestinian resistance today and in the past has always been unarmed resistance. This is true today, and it's true, it is true from the very beginning. The vast majority of Palestinian resistance to Zionism and to Zionist colonization has been unarmed. And I'm sure you know this, Palestinians are considered one of the most incarcerated people in the world, something that Palestinians wear as a badge of honor, because this is a fight for freedom. These are resistance people, people who fight for resistance, they're fighting for their country and for their people. Can I have the next slide, please? So once again, going to the, again, my, my family story and the, the, the personal narrative. Um, in September of 1997, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem by Palestinians. Uh, she was 13 years old, that's her son daughter. And of course, in Israel, this is always big news. This used to be big news when these things happened. And in her case, it was even bigger news because here is the granddaughter of a famous Israeli general as well. I was living here in the U.S. at the time. I took the first plane back to back home. When I got to my sister's apartment in Jerusalem, it was packed with people who came to express their sorrow, uh, Palestinians and Israelis, and the press. You cannot imagine every language, every country, every news agency in the world was there to cover this. And the questions are always the same. Who's responsible? How do we get them? How do we make them pay? How do we show them? And so forth. Um, and when my sister, after the funeral, finally came out to speak to people, she said, well, in terms of revenge and retaliation, she said something very simple. She said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. Don't talk to me about killing more people. The idea of killing people in response to somebody's death is absurd and sick. And what mother, what real mother would want to see this kind of grief 
fall upon another mother. And in terms of who's responsible, she said, well, who is it that has taken Palestinian land, destroyed Palestinian homes, forced Palestinians into exile, throws Palestinian fathers and brothers and mothers into jails, shoots Palestinian children in their schools, denies them water, denies them freedom. It's the Israeli government. It's the state of Israel. And both she and her husband very clearly said, we hold the Israeli government directly responsible for our daughter's death. What do we expect? That we will maintain this brutal oppression against another nation and there will not be a price to be paid? So now this became even bigger news because we have this mother, Israeli mother who just buried her daughter, turning the world upside down. Because we know that the Israelis want peace and the Palestinians don't. We know that the Palestinians are terrorists and the Israelis are victims. In terms of my life, I came back to the US after the funeral and how do you pick up after something like this? I mean, when you see the small coffin going into the ground of a child, it's not like you can brush it off and go to work the next day. Of course, on the other hand, you have no choice. You have to go to work the next day. And my, my good fortune was that in San Diego, I, I found a Jewish-Palestinian discussion group, a dialogue group. This was quite, a, quite, a long, quite many years ago. And this was the first time I ever met Palestinians. And the chapter in my book that begins, talks about this journey begins with the line, my journey into Palestine began in San Diego. I was 39 years old. Now, like I said, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And as you know, they call Jerusalem a mixed city. But of course, even though it is a mixed city, it's a very racist city. It's a completely segregated city. I was just recently in South Africa, and, and, and they understood this very well, what that means. It's a racist, segregated city, so Israelis don't meet Palestinians. So as an Israeli boy, of course, I never met Palestinians. But even more, 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 maybe more significant than that, it was the first time that I was with Palestinians in the same place, and we were equal. In other words, the laws that apply to me and the laws that apply to them were the same laws. There is no place in the entire country, Palestine or Israel, however we choose to call it, where Israelis and Palestinians live by the same laws. Israel claims that the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens have equal rights. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. There is no place in Jerusalem, in the Galilee, in Yaffa, in the Nakab Desert, in the West Bank, or in Gaza where Israelis and Palestinians are equal. And suddenly I was with Palestinians. There were no checkpoints. They didn't need a permit. They had no curfew. We could come, we could talk, and we could leave. And this is another, another, another theme that, was, that, re, that resounded quite strongly in South Africa. Once you meet the people of the other side, so to speak, and you're equal. It's a very powerful experience, a very positive experience, I should say. And then I began hearing about the Nakba, and I began hearing this whole other narrative which, like I said, was diametrically opposed to the narrative that I was raised on and having been raised in a Zionist home with a father who was a general, a grandfather who signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence. This was my, this was my family. Learning about this other narrative and then realizing that that narrative is true and the narrative I was raised upon was a lie is an excruciatingly painful process. It's like having a limb sewn off very slowly without anesthesia. But it's a very positive thing. And eventually what takes place is, especially when you're meeting the other, is that the fear leaves and trust takes its place. And when that happens, when the fear leaves and the trust takes its place, then suddenly the barriers fall and suddenly we're all people. And that was the exact process that, 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 that took place for me. And of course, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Can I have the next slide, please, the last slide? Thank you. So the way the book ends and the way I'll end my remarks tonight has to do with the future and where we go from here. In 1967, Israel completed the conquest of Palestine and established a single state with exclusive rights for Jewish people in all of Palestine. However, the reality is that half the people, or today more than half the people, today Palestinians are the majority. Out of 12 million people that live between the Jordan River and the sea, 5.9 million are Israeli Jews. The rest are Palestinians. Still, they call it a Jewish state, which means the Palestinians are excluded, yet it's not really a Jewish state. 
And I think it's important to say, particularly in this country, when people support the state of Israel, when they accept the state of Israel, when they feel that they're defending the state of Israel, they have to understand and, and own the fact that they are accepting it's a package deal. It comes with thousands of political prisoners. It comes with racist laws. It comes with a brutal military force. It comes with attacks on Gaza. It comes with having children who have no access to health care, even though there's no reason in the world why they shouldn't. Just like there were people here in this country who supported apartheid in South Africa, of course, today everybody denies it. Everybody loved Nelson Mandela, of course. Today, there are people who support the state of Israel, and they have to own the fact that they're supporting a racist, brutal regime. And this is the state of Israel. And if you support that, you need to own it. But there is another option. South Africa has shown us this. Latin America has shown us this. Only in my lifetime, Latin America, countries in Europe, and of course, South Africa, have gotten rid of racist, oppressive regimes in, and replaced them with a democracy. And there is that possibility in Palestine as well. The missing link, the thing that is missing from Palestinians and Israelis living together in a healthy, productive state with a good future is a state with equal rights. It means the end of the racist regime called Zionism. Just like there had to be the end of the oppressive apartheid regime in South Africa for there to be progress in that country. Of course, in this country, when you say something like that, people say, oh, you're like Ahmadinejad, you're Hitler. You want to talk about killing Jews, which is, of course, nonsense. The concept of a single state, a single democratic state, is an inclusive concept. It talks about human rights, respecting everybody's human rights, respecting everyone's civil rights, instead of being exclusive. Israeli and Palestinian societies are very similar societies. Even in Gaza, with all the difficulties and this brutal, cruel siege that's been going on for years, literacy rates are some of the highest in the world, over 90, 92% literacy rates. The problem in Gaza, the reason that we need a PCRF is not because there are no competent doctors, it's because of the situation there has become un, un, unreal. And again, it's a 10-hour drive from, from perfectly good medical centers inside Israel, a 20-minute drive, perfectly modern medical centers and so on. So I am very hopeful because, like I said, you see organizations like Sabil, you see churches around the country, this country and around the world, supporting the cause of Palestine. You see students on campuses holding events to support the cause of freedom and democracy in Palestine. You see BDS that is growing in this country the call to boycott, impose divestment and sanctions on the state of Israel. Five years ago, nobody knew what it was. Today, they talk about it at APAC offices in DC. They discuss it and they worry about it in Jerusalem at the prime minister's office. So good things are happening. And progress towards this is happening. And I'm sure many of you know, and I don't need to tell you this, Palestine is a beautiful country with beautiful people, with, 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 uh, with potential that is endless for prosperity, and for freedom and so forth. Two societies that have traditions of democracy. The missing link, like I said, is equal rights. The missing link is the fact that there is this brutal racist Zionist regime there. And I would say two things to end my, my, my remarks today. One is that the people today who support Palestine, who support the cause of justice and freedom and democracy in Palestine, will, I believe, in the ten year, next 10 years or so, be very proud of the fact that they took part in the change and they had a hand in bringing about the freedom and democracy in Palestine. The people who support the state of Israel, just like the people who supported apartheid in South Africa, will either hide somewhere in shame or deny the fact that they supported Israel. And so I would urge, I don't think I need to urge people in this room tonight, but maybe we can urge others as well, American friends, Jewish friends, and so forth, to support the cause of democracy and freedom in Palestine. So that Israeli children and Palestinian children can live in peace, can live together, so that there won't be a need for a PCRF. Thank you all very much.